Hello, um, welcome to Spain Writes, America Reads. This is the series that we're doing to introduce Spanish writers that have been translated into English and published here in the States. And we're very happy today to have with us Berta Garcia Faed and her translator, Kelsey Banada. And they're gonna talk about the book, The Eligible Age, also with uh, William Blair, who is a Songbridge Project editor. Uh, translating is always a challenge. Translating poetry uh, means a link between the translator and the author. And uh, we were, uh, this is the second time we're doing poetry and we want to do also fiction as we did before, but it's, I think it's very important for us that translator, translators, American translators uh, translate Spanish authors. So I'm very happy that today we have this book. I'm gonna give the floor now to William. You have the floor and uh, very happy to have you here. I just want to thank Ander as always for organizing this and all the people that are gonna be here today with us. Thanks a lot. William. Thank you, Miguel, for your kind introduction. And first and foremost, um, I would like to express our deep appreciation to the Spanish Embassy in Washington, DC for sponsoring the Spain Writes America Read series and for allowing us here at the Songbridge Project to participate. So today we're featuring the book, The Eligible Age, a translation by Kelsey Banada, Alberto Garcia Fayette's La Eda de Merecer. The book, um, I should mention, includes cover art by Saul Salma and a scholarly postscript by Unai Velasco. And now to introduce our poet and our translator. Alberto Garcia Fayette is a poet and translator from Valencia, Spain. She's the recipient of numerous literary awards, including the Premio Nacional de Poesia, Joven Miguel Hernandez. She's published seven books of poetry, including most recently, Corazón, Tradicionalista, a collection of her poetry from 2008 to 2011. Kelsey Venata holds an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers' Workshop and an MFA in Literary Translation from the University of Iowa. She was the recipient of the prestigious Travel Fellowship from the American Literary uh, Translators Association. Uh, Kelsey's published three books of poetry, both her original work and books in translation. The Eligible Age is her first uh, book length uh, publication in translation. Presently, Kelsey's the program manager for Alta in Tucson, Arizona. So let's begin this afternoon's reading with a poem. And um, I'll ask Berta to begin in Spanish and Kelsey to follow with her English translation of the poem about scientific discoveries and love. Berta? Thank you, Bill for the introduction. And I want to begin as well um, with a big thank you to Miguel and Ander and the embassy. They've been so kind and so generous. Thank you again to Kelsey and thank you again um, to Bill. So I'm going to read a poem called Poema sobre los descubrimientos científicos y la transmiración de los poemas de amor. Un mamut recién nacido hace 40.000 años en la lejana península de Yamal, muerto por haber tragado légamo y arcilla hasta asfixiarse y hoy aparecido congelado en el ángulo blanco de un iceberg asceto y hoy reproducido en la fachada fosforescente de la revista Nature, me hace pensar en el tiempo y en el amor desgajado en el tiempo, en la termodinámica ahorcada en la línea del tiempo. Saber que moriremos, que morirá este nudo, saber que tú, mi amor, un día serás hierba. Sobre el material de la ternura que se cree infinita, se editan los efectos de esta lucha a muerte. 
y no puedo evitar pensar tu cuerpo como belleza móvil hacia lo inmóvil. Y el ronroneo existencial me dice que esto es triste. Los órganos genitales no fosilizan, ni la epiglotis es algo más que una ráfaga de niebla con eco. Una vez existió un mamut que barritaba feliz en la ciénaga y ahora ese estrépito ventrudo se ha perdido en la niebla con eco. Quisiera decirte que este poema de amor para no desaparecer se reencarnará, se reencarnará en una rana dorada que producirá dos mil huevos relucientes. Míralo bien, este poema es una charca de un cuento probablemente ruso donde una rana dorada producirá dos mil huevos diáfanos como un arco ojival hecho de espuma humana. Míralo bien, este poema es un episodio de un ejercicio de hipnosis que es un bosque o una voz humana, y es tu mano dorada, abierta a la palma de mi mano dorada, quien, por los siglos de los siglos, lo escribe y lo escribe. Gracias. Y ahora paso la palabra a Kelsey. Now, Kelsey, it's your turn. Okay, here's the English translation. Um, my thanks once again to the team at the cultural office um, for bringing us back together. It's been a while since Berta and I shared a space, so this is fun for us. Um, and thanks to Bill, as always, for, for this book. Um, this is a poem about scientific discoveries and the transmigration of love poems. A newborn mammoth 40,000 years ago on the faraway Yamal Peninsula died of swallowing silt and clay till it asphyxiated. And it appears today frozen in the white crevice of an aesthetic iceberg reprinted on the fluorescent front page of the journal Nature. It makes me think about time and about love taken out of time, about thermodynamics hanged from the timeline knowing that we will die and so will this knot, knowing that you, my love, will one day be grass. The effects of this fight to the death are edited over the material of tenderness, which believes it is infinite. And I can't stop thinking of your body as beauty moving toward the unmoving. And this existential purring tells me this is sad. Genital organs don't fossilize, nor is the epiglottis anything other than a gust of mist with an echo. Once there was a mammoth who trumpeted happily in the bog, and now that pot-bellied racket is lost in the mist with an echo. I'd like to tell you that this love poem, so as not to disappear, will be reincarnated as a golden frog that will produce 2,000 gleaming eggs Think about it. This poem is a pond in a story, probably Russian, where a golden frog produces 2,000 diaphanous eggs, like an agile arch made from the foam of a human. Think about it. This poem is one episode in an exercise in hypnosis, which is a forest or the voice of a human. And it's your golden hand open to the palm of my golden hand, who unto the ages of ages writes it and writes it. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, let me begin the um, questions um, that I might have. And by the way, if either of you have questions of each other, don't hesitate to like interrupt uh, my sequence and, and ask them of each other. But um, beginning with Berta, um, of all the poems in this book, why did you choose this poem to share with us on the program today? Um, thank you for the question. So, um, 
I chose it because I, I like to read it, read it aloud. Some of my poems, I think they are not made to, to do this, but some of them are. Um, when they are not, it's probably because they have so many subordinate clauses or so many parentheses, but this poem, from my point of view, it's very rhythmic and also it's not too difficult and not too simple. So I like to begin with something, let's say, soft, but not too, not too easy. A poem that's approachable. Yeah, but not only approachable, it's also about sound. I think it's, it's sound, mm -hmm. it's orality. Well, the next question, um, and before I go there, I'm going to hold the book up so we can see it, and uh, it is the eligible age. So, Berta, tell us about the title of this book and its significance, and how does this title um, relate to the themes of the poems you've selected for the book? Right, so in Spanish, it's La Edad de Merecer which is an idiomatic expression that it's kind of old and also old fashioned, pretty conservative. And it's something you will say to a girl who has reached the age to probably have, have a boyfriend or maybe marry. But if we look into the metaphor, to merecer, merecer means to deserve. So what's the idea here? we don't deserve anything, we girls or women, until we reach the age of finding a man. So I will say it's a pretty sexist expression and it's about coming of age, right? A particular social construction of coming of age. And this book is a lot about the social construction of femininity and also romantic love. Um, but I wouldn't say it's completely ironical, this title. I think it's more like self-ironical because I am not rejecting the topic of femininity or romantic love. I think I am re rewriting it. At least that was my purpose. Some of the poems um, don't have anything to do with romantic love, I would say. They are more about language or epistemology or religion. But it's true that most of them have this, um, this drive. Hmm. I recall somewhere you mentioning that this was a saying that your grandmother had shared with you. <laughs> I don't know if my grandmother, I think grandmothers in general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it follows from your discussion that the translation of a title can be so critical to a publication. So Kelsey, um, in your translator's note, you write about the challenge of translating this book's title. Can you tell us some more about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was a long process. Um, I worked on this book uh, and with a lot of input from Berta over the course of at least a year and probably longer, including the whole process of editing the, um, the book for publication. But um, yeah, the, the title was really tricky. It's such a, it has such a fantastic quality as an expression. And then all of those kind of cultural resonances and, and kind of the burden of its history that Bertha described. Um, so I knew it had to be something that expressed in English, this sense of um, stepping into something new. So I, I did a lot of searching in the thesaurus for, um, different ways to, to capture this concept of merit or deserving something. Um, that's how I landed eventually on, on eligible, um, that you, know, you reach a point where suddenly 
uh, you are able to receive something. And it, I didn't want the title to specify too clearly what that thing should be. Um, for a while, I, you know, I, I tried to create my own idiom, something like the marriageable age, where it hinted at that, um, you know, be, being of the age to marry and sort of, again, all of the, the weight of expectation on that. Um, but I think that that was, that was too specific of a choice. Um, so something like the eligible age doesn't get too far into marriage specifically, but, but sort of hints that there is something that's coming to you once, once you re reach this certain point. Um, I, uh, I even considered at the beginning choosing something kind of um, culturally representative in the United States and in cultures I've grown up in. So, so I grew up in North Carolina and in the Southern US, uh, the idea of being a debutante or a debutante ball is kind of your, that's your coming of age moment as a, as a young woman. Um, of course, that would have been, that would have, you know, changed this book's, um, all of its references totally. And so that wasn't right for, for this book, but who knows, maybe someday there'll be another translation of it that, that is a more experimental translation and totally resituates, um, you know, the concerns that these poems bring up in, in the, you know, the South, the Southern United States, for example. Um, but I think the eligible age is, you know, it's, it captures pretty well some of those things we spoke about. It also has a nice sound to me. Um, and, uh, and I sort of surveyed a bunch of poet friends to, to check that title with them because I wasn't sure about it and got a lot of good feedback um, from people I trust. So, uh, that's how it, it came to be. Yeah, <clears throat> I think your choice invites a broader cultural interpretation. Right. The title then say marriageable would have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Well, let's move from the cover and the title to the interior. And I'll ask Berta first a question about poetic form. The book encompasses a variety of poetic forms. Um, one reviewer likened uh, works from the book to, uh, for example, Harvard Outline. So Berta, what was important to you about writing in so many different forms from letters, outlines, footnotes, through revisions of biblical passages and what guides you to the right form for each poem? If that's the right question to ask. <laughs> I think it's a very difficult, difficult question. Um, do you know what? I, I think I, I think that it's intuition. I think that if I explain the form of the poems afterwards, it's kind of like a rationalization exposed. So I can say, all I can say is that I like contrast. It's not much, it's not that much about variety, but contrast, like difference, um, deep differences of registers, of um, slang, of let's say, like you said, Bible versus I don't know, pop songs, that's what I do. Um, I think it's about contrast, but I don't have like a theory or very specific explanation of why this form in particular versus other form or other form. Hmm. Um, variation in form to me as I, I've read the book brings um, an element of uh, energy to the book itself. Um, is there is there something to that? To that choice of poems in different forms that went into the book? If that. Yeah, I think maybe it's a matter of trying to capture um, the drive of um, of totality. Of course, it's an utopia, right? But. It's like a dictionary or a manual of how to come of age, 
how to perform coming of age. And you have so many different instructions and so many different discourses that you listen to and also discourses that you produce. So I would say it's again, a matter of contrast and contrast trying to, um, trying to reach something, something bigger. But I don't know what that something bigger will be. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, um, Kelsey, Berta's choice um, or uh, decision to use varied forms in the book imposes a challenge for you as a translator. So tell us about your experience with translating multiple types of poems in this book. And Absolutely. I'm going to make it a two-part question. Um, okay. So what's your usual translation strategy? And did the variations in these poems challenge you to modify that, that practice? Yeah, those are those are really good questions. Um, and it struck me as you were talking, Bertha, that that actually having so many different forms of poems in this book, it helps the book to enact this question of how to become yourself, because coming of age, I think, is also becoming Well, I hope Kelsey catches up with us here. Yes. Are you back, Kelsey? I, I think I'm back. Sorry. Oh, all right, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it happens again, I'll switch to my phone. Um, yeah, I think that having different forms in this book allows for the exploration of how to create yourself when there are so many possible ways of doing it already shown to you. Um, uh, you know, for example, if we inherit the idea that a poem should be written in beautifully crafted lines, you know, how does the self manage to express, um, you know, something sincere in the in that mold that it's been given. So I understand these many forms as kind of the speaker of these poems searching and trying on kind of that performance that you spoke about, Bertha, trying on multiple different forms to see which one might fit and which way of expression might lead to the most, um, the most sincerity. So to your question, Bill, I think that um, translating many different forms meant that I had to be kind of agile as a translator and practice jumping between different styles. Um, there was probably no one translation strategy that that worked for all of them. Um, you know, I, I just thought it was a really, it's just a, it was a fun ride. It was kind of a fun and wild ride to write some poems in lines where you're really thinking about um, where does the line end and how does the line break create some kind of suspense or irony. Bersa uses a lot of irony in these poems. Um, and then, you know, the very next poem might be almost like a prose block where the speaker just kind of continues this monologue that never seems to stop. And it's really a matter of watching for the, the sound and the repetition that might keep that, uh, that might sustain that longer kind of form. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think I really relied often on, on asking Bersa questions and that was that was very helpful. I also, translators get really nerdy about research. So I, I did a lot of um, research to, to find the, you know, the allusions that Bersa was making to biblical passages and, you know, find um, English translations of the Bible that, you know, I could rewrite and, and insert that into my translation. Um, yeah, I, I think it just, 
it just was an enjoyable process overall. Um, yeah, I don't, maybe I'll leave it there. Well, that's great. Well, to get an added sense of the, um, of the beauty and range of the poems in the eligible age, perhaps I could ask Berta and uh, Kelsey to share another read with us. Um, this time, the poem about the river Lethe. Berta, would you like to begin? Yes. Poema sobre el río Leteo. El río Leteo es uno de los ríos del Hades. Las branquias tostadas del atardecer son siempre las mismas. El color del molusco llamado murice, el color del sobresalto, forra el cielo y el agua. La forma del molusco llamado murice, la forma de la peonza con espinas, imita la forma de mi corazón. Leteo significa olvido y A significa sin. Río significa río. Letella significa sin olvido y aletella significa verdad. Este cuadríptico es humillante. Philip Chandos sufre un poco menos que yo, pero el coxis torcido de las noches de abril debe mencionarse. Abril me trajo mirra, codos con sangre y argot. El problema fue el nácar, porque las cosas del mundo son eternamente veloces contra mi palabra y las cosas del mundo son infaliblemente lenguaraces en su mudez. Las cosas del mundo se arraciman en una barricada de canciones o en un dédalo de dados o de mercurio o en una puesta de sol o de largo para que no pueda encontrarlas. Auscultar y besar presuponen tacto. Las cosas del mundo se apretujan en manojos de palomillas hambrientas que resbalan entre la fruta húmeda. Cazar y saborear presuponen contextura. Una vez palpé un húmero esotérico y era tu húmero. Una vez palpé una nuca contus contusionada y era tu nuca. Imaginé o comprendí que tu piel es transparente. Imaginé comprender qué es la belleza. La verdad, con mayúsculas, fue una diosa encantadora, hija del tiempo y de la virtud. Antes, la estética y la bondad iban a todas partes juntas. Mi fantasía sexual de acorrolar al oprimido hubiera resultado muy erótica e inmoral. Di, por ejemplo, amor. Alguien pronuncia Write down your email and I'll check if you exist. Di, por ejemplo, amor. ¿Ves? Choca contra la llaga, vuela y rompe la bombilla. El mito y el azúcar se disuelven. Si fuera verdad que la verdad es un recuerdo, yo me rebelaría contra la verdad. La verdad es un terrón de moho. El recuerdo es imposible. No todo se olvida porque no todo pasa. Las cosas del mundo imitan la forma de mi corazón y tienen el color del sobresalto. Vi, por ejemplo, amor y ya no está. Nunca estuvo, no es magia, no es traspié. Son los límites del lenguaje y del río. Tú, mueca barroca, hacia arriba y desciendes. Gracias. the river Lethe. The river Lethe is one of the rivers of Hades. The tanned gills of nightfall are always the same. The color of the mollusk called murex, color of being startled, lines the sky and the water. The shape of the mollusk called murex, shaped like a spinning top with spines, imitates the shape of my heart. Lethe means forgetting and ah means without. River means river. Lithia means without forgetting and alithia means truth. This quadriptych is mortifying. 
Philip Chandos suffers a bit less than I, but the contorted coccyx of April nights is worth mentioning. April brought me myrrh, bloody elbows, and argo. The problem was the knacker, because the things of this world are everlastingly swift against my word. And the things of this world are infallibly, infallibly garrulous in their muteness. The things of this world cluster in a barricade of songs or in a maze of dice or mercury or in a setting sun or far off so they can't be found. Auscultating and kissing presupposed touch. The things of this world squeeze into bunches of hungry moths slipping between humid fruits. Hunting and tasting presupposed composition. Once I felt an esoteric humerus and it was your humerus. Once I felt a nape covered in contusions and it was your nape. I imagined or understood that your skin is transparent. I presumed I understood what beauty is. Truth in capital letters was an enchanting goddess, the daughter of time and virtue. Earlier aesthetics and goodness went everywhere together. My sexual fantasy of corralling the downtrodden would have turned out very erotic and moral. Say for instance, love. Someone utters, write down your email and I'll check if you exist. Say for example, love. See, it collides with the wound, flies and breaks the light bulb. Myth and sugar dissolve. If it were true that truth is a memory, I would rebel against truth. Truth is a clump of mold. Memory is impossible. Not everything is forgotten because not everything happens. The things of this world imitate the shape of my heart and have the color of being startled. Say, for example, love, and now it's gone. It was never here. It's not magic. It's not a blunder. Those are the limits of language and of the river. You making a neo-baroque face upward and you descend. Thank you, Kelsey, Berta. You know, as I was um, recently reconsidering this uh, text and reading through some of the poems and putting it into a perspective, I thought to myself, this is a, this is a coming of age uh, tractate, a treatise on steroids. It's intensely personal, sophisticated, and intellectual. Which leads me to ask the next question of Berta. So, and this is a difficult question and approach it as you will. So which of the poems in this book opens up uh, most uh, to who you are or were in this coming of age experience? <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's a difficult question, but like all good questions, I mean, it has to happen, right? They have to be difficult to be, to be good. Um, so I don't know exactly who I am or what I am or how I am. And I don't really understand my poetry. I could say I do if I speak, if I decide to speak as an academic, but um, I, I, I would prefer not to. <laughs> so I, all I could say is that I believe in in rigor's theory, which is that literature is life and vice versa. So all my life is in my books, but it's not exactly autobiographical. And if I have to choose one poem, I could just choose the one I just read, which is about, um, as I said, language and the limits of knowledge and poetry is, is a lot about that about reflecting and being self-aware of how language shapes us and limits us but also multiplies us 
Yeah. Excellent. So, so thank you. Thank you much. No, thank I'm you. I'm going to follow up with another question, but I better I better hold that one back for, for, <laughs> for a little bit. So, uh, uh, Kelsey, um, let's turn to you. Um, I would like to lead with a comment that the range of relationships between poets and their translator or translators, as the case may be, is really remarkable um, in, in respect to the field of translation. And those um, closer relationships, I think, mark one of the underappreciated facets of the cultural dimension of literary translation. So with that opening, um, I would uh, ask you to maybe explain more to us about um, your working relationship with Berta during your translation process. You alluded to it earlier. Could you expand on it? Yeah, definitely. I would, I would love to. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm really glad we read this poem because I do think it's a great example of um, how sort of nothing holds like anything we say in language could be can be erased. It doesn't it doesn't stay fast, right? And it feels slippery. Um, I love that line, truth is a clump of mold. Um, you know, it doesn't take itself too seriously here. And there's this sort of impulse to speak despite the fact that that you know we have that there's limits of language, like you said, Bertha. Um, um, yeah, I think Bipta and I had a really great working relationship, um, maybe a very millennial one. We went back and forth a lot on Facebook Messenger uh, when I had specific questions that I wanted to ask. Um, and I don't mean like, I don't mean that I was asking Bipta, what does this word mean exactly, but more like, can you help me to see what I should, you know, how do I see this image correctly so that I can then create the image in English? Um, you know, sometimes really personal anecdotes would come up. Uh, Bersa, do you remember it? There's, there's one line where you you write about your orange muscles, musculos, nara musculos naranja, naranjos, that's the line. Um, and I kept searching for this, like there must be some reference. Okay, atrofia en los musculos naranja. Uh, there must be some reference I'm missing here. Orange, orange muscles. What is that? Uh, you know, I asked a lot of Spanish-speaking friends of mine, and and everyone was like, "Gosh, I don't know." So I asked Bessa about it, and she said, "Oh, that's you know, that's sort of how I, I experience this kind of synesthesia with my own body, and that's sort of how I see my own muscles." I I love knowing that little detail about you, but you know, we had to talk about it for me to find that out. Um, we had to have a conversation about it. Um, so yeah, Bersa was extremely generous in our in our process of working together. Um, but but I think as you as you can see, especially from that last poem, um, a lot of a lot of Bersa's work has to do with this idea of like language as life, but also the instability of language, and and sort of this um, you know in this sense she was she was not controlling of the outcome of the English translation. There was this agreement kind of early on that, you know, I was working on these poems and that they would be a version, my version in English. Um, and I, yeah, that just goes to kind of show her approach to, to what poetic language is and does, um, whether it's, you know, in the original Spanish or in the, or in the English translation. Um, we didn't get to meet in person during the process of working on the book, but we did get to meet um, after it was published in Valencia. So that was really special. Um, and we've certainly, I think, bonded over some of the, the poems in this book. Um, you know, there's some really excellent breakup poems that allowed us to kind of talk and, and develop a, a closer personal relationship too loved translating those poems. They're just so angry. Great. Um, so that's what I, yeah, that's what I would say about, about our shared experience. I don't, Berta, do you want to say anything about, about that? 
Yeah, I want to say that I feel this is an amazing, amazing version. I'm completely in love. And when I hear you reading the poems, I smile because it's like, it, they, they are different poems. And I will say that better <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Somehow yeah, better. Different. And I want to thank you again because you were so patient and so passionate. And I, I never dream, dreamt I could work with someone who was willing to work very slowly through alliteration, through rhythm, especially alliter alliteration, also internal rhymes. That was very important for me in the, in the book, in the original version of the book. Because as you said, I, I work with synesthesia, so that's important. And also, I, I just want to clarify that I agree it's a great image. Uh, truth is something with the mold, right? Truth is, I, I don't remember. A clump, of, a clump of mold? Something like that, but it's yeah. not mine. It's inspired by, ah. uh, by Hoffman style. Letter to Lord Shandos. It's an amazing book and it was very influential for me. Yeah, I think it, be, it becomes yours though, too, in the way that all of, our, all of the references that we take in inform, inform us. Yeah, maybe, thank you. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, I'm gonna move us on just, um, just a, a little here and um, and point out that in translation discourse, um, you know, we've heard the, the um, opinions that um, only poets should translate poets, or the opposite is that only translators should translate poets. Here we have an unusual situation in which Kelsey is both a poet and a translator. Now, I'm not going to ask Kelsey to enter into that controversy about who should translate poetry and what their qualifications should be, but I'm gonna take a little twist on it and um, ask you what effect did translating Berta's work have on you as a poet? Yeah. Um... You think. It, it <laughs> definitely, yeah, it definitely did. I, I don't think that you, you can possibly spend over a year sort of sharing someone else's language in your, in your mind and working around different ways of expressing that language in a new language. I don't think you can go through that without having some effect on the language that that comes out of you or that, that comes out of me as a poet. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the words that I chose for these English poems, those were always, always with me. Um, and in that sense informed other things I was writing. Um, thematically, I can also say that uh, I think working with Berta's poems helped me to kind of switch modes from the poems I was writing before translating this book, which were more about um, like my family history and, and sort of family memory. Uh, and, and translating Berta's poems allowed me to think about um, more freely writing about myself. Um, not really like self-portraiture exactly, but using my human experience, my bodily experience, my experience of language um, as a way of kind of thinking around something. So my poems, I think, did change after translating um, this book. And I have also experimented more with, with prose or with, um, you know, some of the, the types of forms that Betta uses here that, uh, that are not lineated, um, that, are, that are not as fragmentary, but sort of are more um, extended. I, I've experimented um, with that too, which has been really really fruitful for me, I think. You, do you feel that your experimentation with form has been successful? Um, I mean, I like these poems, but <laughs> can we ever really judge our own poems? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we get to do that. Um, 
there, there's something that feels kind of vital about them, I would say, um, that feels good to write them. I, I think I also do more, um, I find myself quoting more often in the poems I write, quoting things other people say, uh, you know, more frequent like uh, allusions or actually just inserting quotes from other poems into my poems which is something that Betsa does a lot. And you, you heard some of that, um, the example that she explained of um, bringing in another writer's language. I think it helped me to see how my language could kind of knock against um, things other people say and, and things that I read that I collect and put into, the, into my poems. Well, we have a, another reading lined up, but I think what I'd like to do is move to a few uh, questions. And, and then if we have time, we can return to perhaps a third reading or another question or two. Uh, the first uh, question from Valerie Harris is to Berta. And this question is, what are your favorite living poets? Wow, that's a long question. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Maybe if you could offer one, two, three, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I prefer to say yes, one, two, or three. Yeah. Um, in the US, I love Dorothy Alasky. I think she's awesome. And in Spain, um, I love the poetry of some of my um, colleagues and also friends. Sachas Unai Velasco, you know him because he did the, um, he wrote something. I can't remember if it was a prologue or the, the postscript. The postscript. Yeah. Um, and Angela Segovia, Angela Segovia's poetry. Thank you. And the next question is from Scott Randall, and he asks, um, well, first he says, thank you for those beautiful readings. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll second that. I wanted to ask Berta about the impact of the Spanish National Youth Poetry Award on her career. Um, what was it like to receive such recognition? I don't know. I was very, 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 very happy. Mm -hmm. And I liked that. Um, more people read me. That's what I want in the end to be to be read to approach more um, potential readers. So that's what the prize gave me more readers. <laughs> um, let's see, we probably have enough time to do the third reading and close with a question or two. Should we give that a try? And the third reading would be about, um, would be from Beethoven's Fingers. Yeah, this is a long poem of one, two, three, four, five, 1,000 pages. And I will just read the title and one footnote. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, we had in mind the footnote from page 30. 30, yes. Yeah. I will read also the title though, because yes, it's, excellent. it's important. Dedos de pianista más la cara que puso Ludwig van Beethoven cuando le dije que quería escribir un poema con más o menos rima, más. ¿Por qué abandoné la música y por qué mencioné al menos una vez la brisa? Más, salutación optimista a los sucesivos amantes y al tú lírico que siempre es plural. Más, salutación cordial a aquella profesora de solfeo, 1998-2000. Cuando crezco, los sucesivos amantes señalan la longitud nigromántica de mi dedo corazón. Tienes dedos de pianista, dice ella, 
pero para pasar de curso tendrás que acariciar todos los huesos del maestro Ludwig van Beethoven, dice ella. Tienes dedos de pianista, pero tendrás que ser excelente, tendrás que desmayarte con los ojos abiertos, tendrás que dejar de traducir lluvias y brumas y lodos y brisas mediante aturdidísimos poemas sobre París, dice ella. Y yo lo intento, furiosa y laboriosa, pero fracaso y fracaso mejor y mucho mejor el vaivén del sacrificio segrega un rojo fresco muy conmovedor. Entonces soy un lugar reseco, un compás reseco. Toco muy bien la parálisis en un órgano eléctrico de cinco escalas. Allí me pierdo. Mis padres me lo compraron para que fuera feliz. Allí me encuentro. Conclusión. Años después llegas tú quemas todo y retiras el vinilo despegando la aguja del ejemplo. Conclusión, yo prefiero el braille y la cereza. Años después llegas tú, señalas con tu dedo corazón la longitud nigromántica de mi dedo corazón fosforito. Mis padres me compraron una libreta con arabescos y búhos para que fuera feliz, para que buceara en el ardid de ciertos aturdidísimos poemas sobre ciertos amaneceres semicliché y sobre un tal Balstein. Conclusión, escribí un poema con más o menos rima y el perímetro del tocadiscos lindaba con mi cuerpo muy naturalmente, que lindaba y linda con tu cuerpo muy naturalmente. Dices, tienes dedos de pianista, pero no toques nada, no lo vayas a romper. Dices, iremos a la playa a remover cascajos de fuego y releeremos la biblioteca de tu, de tu lactancia. Dices, me gusta mucho tu ínclita zarza ubérrima. Dices, las olas son cúpulas, onomatopeyas del fin del mundo. Aunque te burles bondadosamente de todo, aunque declames numerosas cantinelas extramodernistas, aunque tengas dedos de pianista, yo te amo. Dices, Bésame en el corazón de esta nemotécnica gruta, bésame desde tu niñez y desde tu vejez y desde tu colección de lluvias y brumas y lodos y brisas, dices, bésame, cállate ya, por favor, y no escribas esto, no lo vayas a romper. Gracias. This is pianist fingers. Asked Ludwig von Beethoven's face when I told him I wanted to write a poem with more or less rhyme. Plus, why I gave up music and why I mentioned the breeze at least once. Plus, optimistic greeting to successive lovers and to the ever plural lyric you. Plus, cordial greeting to my first piano teacher, 1998 to 2000. When I grow up, successive lovers point out the necromantic length of my middle finger. You have pianists' fingers, she says, but to pass the course, you'll have to stroke all of Maestro Ludwig von Beethoven's bones. You'll have to be superb. You'll have to faint with your eyes open, she says. You'll have to quit trying to translate the rain and haze and mud and breeze in befuddling poems about Paris, and I try hard. I try fierce and industrious, but fail and fail better and much better. The swinging of the sacrifice secretes a very moving fresh red. So I am an arid place, an arid compass. I play for Elise very well on a five scale electric organ. That's where I get lost. My parents bought it for me to make me happy. That's where I find myself in some. Years later, you arrive, burn everything, and take away the records, detaching the needle of the example. In some, I prefer braille and cherries. Years later, you arrive, you point out with your middle finger, the necromantic length of my fluorescent middle finger. My parents bought me a notebook covered in arabesque designs and owls to make me happy. So I delve into the artifice of some befuddling poems about certain semi semi-cliché sunrises, and about some guy Waldstein in some. I wrote a poem with more or less rhyme, and the contours of the record player bordered on my body, bordered very naturally, border on your body, very naturally. You say, 
You have pianist fingers, but don't touch anything lest you break it. You say, we'll go to the beach to clear away embers of fire and we'll reread your lactation library. I really like your illustrious fertile blackberry bush. The waves are onomatopoeic domes from the end of the world. Even though you mock everything good naturedly, you say, even though you denounce all those extra modernists, even though you have pianist fingers, I love you. Kiss me in the heart of this mnemonic cave. Kiss me from your childhood and from your old age and from your collection of rain and haze and mud and breeze. You say, kiss me, shut up already, please. And don't write about this lest you break it. Wow. That poem is a, it's a whirlwind of syntactical gestures and images and uh, ideas. It, it's, it's quite amazing. That's one of my favorites. But it does lead me to um, what may be our closing um, question. And <clears throat> the question would be that um, Lucina Schnell said, I'd call Garcia Fayette's project, referring to this book, a linguistic rebellion. Do the two of you agree with this suggestion? Um, or what do you make of this assessment? While you're you thinking, you can probably tell where I come down <laughs> in respect to the answer to the question. But um, Berta, Kelsey, either of you? You, you go first. <laughs> OK. Um... I, I would like it to be a rebellion. I'm not sure it is, but that, that will be the, I don't know if the intention, but the, the, the drive for inspiration. Um, I love Roland Barthes, and he has this idea that language is fascist in one book, but then in another book, he talks about the pleasure of certain, certain types of language, which are uncontrollable. And um, I like to work within this tension. I don't believe my writing is free, but I like to play. <laughs> I like to play freely, let's say. But I don't know what is freedom or if my language or language in general may, may um, reach it. So with freedom, but not to the point of rebellion? I don't know. I want to be a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, but one thing is what I want. The other thing is what I, what I, what I get, <laughs> what I manage to do. To create. <laughs> yeah. Kelsey? I think this book feels like linguistic rebellion to me. Um, again, that idea of like trying on different forms, but sort of defamiliarizing all of all of these forms, even within themselves. You know, we know what the form of a footnote is typically like when we're reading an academic paper, for example. So here, these footnotes clearly serve a very different purpose. They're kind of they're rebelling from their form, right? Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's language that is recognizable and familiar in here, especially when it gets quoted from some other source, but I think that gets kind of, um, it all gets defamiliarized as, as these many kinds of language sort of um, come up against each other. Yeah. Well, so we're getting later in the afternoon. Um, Berta, Kelsey, I would like to deeply and profoundly um, thank you for your well-considered and thoughtful responses. Um, I think it's been um, a wonderful exchange. And with that, Miguel, I'll turn the program back to you. Thank you, William. Thank you all. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Uh, hoping to read the next Linguistic Rebellion of Bertha soon and read it in English through Kelsey.
<laughs> and I'm hoping to see Berta here in the States uh, soon. So thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you much. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs>